Welcome back, guys. We got episode 20, the last podcast of the year. It's actually going to be coming out in the first week of January, but we're filming it in the last few days of December. It's been a good year. So what's going on in the market? Home sales in different parts of the countries have definitely changed quite a bit. So the Midwest and the South, we've seen a relative uptick year over year, but in the West and the Northeast has seen declines. I wonder why. I mean, you could probably guess the prices are quite different between the West and the Northeast. A lot of investors are focusing in that Midwest area and the South a lot cheaper. It's kind of an investor's heaven. It's still one of the few places in the country where you can actually exceed your mortgage payment with your rent. So that makes sense. But when it comes down to it, we're seeing a very interesting thing going on to where we are in, in the winter market. So we're seeing less listings, but a lot of the time, especially in California, the demand is even less. So supply is dropping month over month because of course we're going through the holidays the winter market a lot of people like to wait until the beginning of the year or wait until springtime but when it comes down to it supply is able to be partially absorbed but there's a lot of unsold listings that are spilling over into more recent months so we're seeing homes that were listed in october still seeping into December and probably going into January. So as far as I saw, we were seeing about three months of inventory. So for sale has reduced the last couple of months, um, which is our listings, but demand has even more. Let's take, let's take it in real world percentages. So let's just say demand has gone down by 20, 20% and listings have gone down by 15%. There's a 5% um, wiggle room in there. I fear when rates do improve, that supply won't be able to jump until rates get to a certain level and point of lowness in order for people to be incentivized to actually buy because they don't want to go from three to seven. They would rather go from three to five. That's my guess. But Moving on, inventory is exceeding demand, which is fantastic. But the big news, I kind of touched on it a little bit there, but the big news is, is that the Fed is pretty much announced that it's looking like they're going to be softening their monetary policy, which is a fancy way of saying it looks like they're going to be reducing the federal funds rate, which directly correlates to the interest rate that you get on your mortgage. So, if we see rate cuts, it's anticipated to see upwards of three rate cuts starting at the end of quarter one, which is end of March. And if that begins to happen, you know demand's coming back. It's an interesting situation. So my big concern with this is if rates actually, they come back and supply and, supply and demand, they've really been hitting each other pretty consistently over the past year and a half, two years. So when that, when you hit an equilibrium, which is a, again, a fancy way of saying you have just amount of buyers to be able to absorb the amount of homes that are on the market, that's going to push values to stay flat or go up just a little bit. So we actually saw a year over year still minor appreciation. It was either, it was about one to 4%. When rates get slashed by a quarter another quarter, another quarter, so another 0.75, and we're in the low six or high to mid fives, you know buyer demand's coming back. I, I was reading an article today. It's like there's a big economist that was talking about the fact that he's concerned that there's not going to be enough homes for sale. There's not going to be enough homes to buy in the United States if that were to, if that were to happen. So hopefully... It's interesting because as a loan officer, you'd think low rates, it's fantastic, which is great for refinances, but it's not so great if they come down too quickly because if there's an influx of buyers, there's not enough supply to be able to support that. So I'm, I'm concerned to see what we saw in 2020 and 2021 because that was an absolute, frankly, shit show that people were making absurd purchase price offers fifty hundred hundred fifty thousand dollars over asking just to get a property um and buyer's remorse happens stuff like that so we'll just see how how that unfolds so the biggest thing is many analysts are concerned that there's not going to be enough homes on the market in order to purchase if rates continue to go down so my personal strategy going into this is i'm trying to get my tax returns done as fast as possible i'm actually talking i've been working with my cpa the last couple of weeks just to see how much 
I'm going to be profiting. So I, because of course I'm self-employed, um, so I'm going to be full tax return last two years, and I need to make sure that I can qualify income wise on my net income. So I'm trying to get that done ASAP so I can be a buyer during still during the winter time because I really do think this is going to be one of the last times, honestly, if, if it ends up unfolding like this, it might be one of the last times to where you can actually get some sort of a deal in real estate. I'm concerned we're pushing towards a route of a high renters market because, of course, everyone has been conditioned to know that markets go up and down and they do, but if there's a certain point to where if demand continues to meet supply, there's no reason why prices for homes would go down because as you keep hitting that, you keep hitting that, you keep hitting that, you keep pushing it up. And if you keep testing new demand curves then and, it keep, and supply keeps hitting it, then we're going to keep seeing that. So when it comes down to it, I think that the best thing that you can do if you are the person that's waiting to buy a home is to lock it in during the winter time while there's still some sort of deals out there because frankly you're working with the possibilities of the market and you're you're working with the opportunities of simply for this fact people are not paying attention during the holiday season and really it starts in November, December, January. It starts to get a little bit more, a little more traffic in February. Then March, it starts picking it up, and then April, May, June, it's back, ready to go. That's just when it just starts popping off again. Lock it in now because that's going to be my my personal strategy. I'm going to go into it during this winter time. And the buyers I'm working with right now, they know this. I put a video out talking about how people can utilize an FHA loan to purchase their home. And what's cool with an FHA loan is that for one, you can put three and a half percent down on your purchase. Um, you only need a 550 credit score, 580 to, to still put three and a half percent down. You can actually go down to 500. You just have to put 10% down. But the point is with an FHA loan, you can make six months of on-time mortgage payments after you get into that home. And then you can qualify what's called for an FHA streamline refinance. What this is, is that you're not going to be getting any sort of appraisal. So values don't matter. No income re-verification. So you don't need to provide any W-2s, tax returns, and no repulling of your credit. And the costs are a lot cheaper in terms of loan costs. So you can utilize right now. And if you play your cards right, honestly, I can see people being not even have to deal with today's current rates for more than six to 12 months. Because remember, let's just say we close in January. Our first payment wouldn't be until March. March, April, May, June, July. You can start refinancing actually before that July 1st payment. And that is when everything is anticipated to start. We probably will have a rate cut already happening at that time. So if you're trying to be strategic, I'm usually not a big forecaster, but based off of the knowledge and the news that's been come out recently, it's looking like towards the end of the next year is going to when we see the majority of the rate cuts hit your mortgage rates. And realistically, there's you can continue you can do this more times down the road too. Let's just say in 2026 rates improve even more. You can do it again. Real estate, we all no, it's actually a real asset. Let's be honest, the numbers on our phone and our bank account are simply just a representation of time exchanged for money. It's just time on a quantitative perspective. Really, that's all what money is sitting in a bank account. So all we know is this home ownership is really the basic but most sound investment you can make. It's tangible. There's utility. There's tax benefits to it. There is not an asset like it. You have gold, silk, you have commodities, you have all these things, but real estate is the most versatile in my opinion. Yeah, my buyers know this. They're taking advantage of it now and they almost feel like they have the secret sauce. They talk to me. It's almost like kind of like a, like, don't tell anybody about this type of vibe because they know that it's very, very strategic. Traditionally, investors buy during the winter time. Why is that? Because everyone else is asleep and everyone else is, has their head stuck in the sand, not focusing because it's a lot easier to do so. But 
there's a quote. I'll ha- I have to read this quote because it's so it's so pertinent to this situation. Let me let me pull this up here. So this is this is a quote by Warren Buffett: "To be fearful when others are greedy, and to be greedy only when others are fearful." That's Warren Buffett, and he's one of the richest men in the world. So those are the people that I follow. Those are the people that I, I, it's so hard to be able to think that way, but it's so true. Some of the most wealthy people that, that you see on social media, on the internet, or maybe, you know, them personally, that's how they operate. They buy when others aren't. That's also how investment companies were operate too. That's how you find deals. Why do people think, why do you think people go for off markets? Because people aren't paying attention to those properties because there's hidden deals within them. So the winter market is the easiest way to tap into that deal opportunity before everyone else wakes up and comes back into the market and just starts understanding, yeah, real estate's great. Real estate's great. Yeah, we know. So at the end of the day, long story short, just set yourself up for success. And the loan program that you choose is going to dictate that too. So FHA is a great tool and you can use this and VA actually has the same exact protocol too. It's called a VA Earl an interest rate reduction loan. So it's the same protocol as an FHA loan, six months of payments. It's great. Conventional, you can do this. It's not a streamline. You have to do a rate and term conventional. So this is another thing to keep in mind. If you uh, want to purchase with a conventional loan is you want, I recommend if you're trying to play this game, uh, which usually, as you guys know, I'm not a proponent of trying to time anything, but um, given, given the light and the understanding of where the Fed's at, seeing that it's already insinuated that we've hit the top of our mark. They said in the last Fed meeting that it's looking like we're at the top of our here for our Fed, our monetary tightening, which is a fancy way of saying the height of which we are going to plan to bring interest rates up to. So that's a big deal. It's like we hit the peak as rates go down, values do this. So it's it's an interesting thing. So conventional, if I were to, if you were to, to play this type of strategy, I recommend to put at least 5% down. And the reason being is because with a conventional loan, uh, you need at least 5% in equity in your home in order to do a rate and term conventional refinance. So let's just use the example of um, I purchased in January, I put 5% down for a conventional loan. You appreciate 2% year over year, you refinance in a year after that. Uh, you should be good because at that point, you'll probably have, if you were to have the 5% down you put down, then the 2% that appreciated over year over year, which is the general average of um, curbing inflation, which is usually the average for appreciation too. Um, it's actually higher, but 2% is a good number to use. Um, but if we were to take 5% plus 2%, we're at 7%. So that would be able to cover um, also all the closing costs so you don't have to come out of pocket. So let's just say, take the same example, we put 3% down, which you can do as you're, if you're a first time home buyer using a conventional loan. Another year goes by, well, one year goes by and we appreciate, our home appreciates by 2%. So 3%, which is our initial down payment plus 2% in um, equity or appreciation, we're at 5%. You can do a conventional rate and term refinance, but keep in mind, those closing costs are going to have to come out of pocket if you do not have enough equity in order to pay that off. So this is the reason why I've been pushing the FHA so much because it just is set up so well for you. And I wanted to introduce a new little series here because I think there's a lot of myths surrounding the mortgage industry and just mortgage thoughts, buying homes in general. I want to address some of them just because I think it'd be fun. And it also will give you guys opportunities to put some comments below or DM me or whatever to be able to tell me about something that you thought was true, but maybe it's not. So we can talk about on the podcast, deep dive, and just talk about it and figure out if it's true or not. So the first one is pre-qualification is the same as pre-approval. No, that is not the case at all. Pre-qualification is as simple as this. Hey, John, I'm looking to buy a home. I have a 700 credit score. My income is $10,000 and I have about $500 a month in debt with a $10,000 down payment. Can I qualify? Yeah. They give you a rough 
rough ID on budget. And that's called a pre-qualification. It can be done on the phone, it can be done in person, whatever. But the point is there's no verification whatsoever. So a pre-approval is going to be filling out a loan application, providing me your full last two years W-2s or tax returns if you're self-employed, last two months of bank statements or quarterly statements if it's coming from a different asset account for your down payment and closing costs. And if it's down payment assistance, then it's a different case still. It's always good to be able to provide bank statements so you can see how much you can bring to the table for just the closing costs, not the down payment, um, and a copy of ID and uh, running credit. So it's, as you can see on the pre-approval side, you're doing full due diligence, verifying everything to make sure that they have the credibility as a buyer to be able to make these payments after they close on the loan and they can perform when they get into contract. So big difference between the two. If you hear pre-qualification, especially if this this goes out to an agent, if you hear pre-qualification over the phone or on a letter, call that loan officer and make sure that did you mean pre-approval or pre-qualification? Because Sam told me there's a big difference because there is. Um, number two, this one's funny. It's, um, it's not funny, but it speaks to me just because it's been everything we've talked about for the last year and a half, two years. The interest rate is the only important factor. No, it is an important factor, but is not the only thing that impacts your monthly payment and your overall cost to your loan. So for one, insurance is a big factor. So if you're buying a property in a rural area, your insurance might be double or triple of where it would be if you were in a normal metropolitan or suburbia area that's not in a high fire risk area. Um, another thing is if you buy in a Melarus area. So that's a fancy way of saying, that's, that's, my, that's my word of the day, fancy. Um, when you buy in an area that is newly incorporated, so there's maybe um, open bonds, which is used for funding. It's an additionally an additional tax added to that area of living. These bonds are used to essentially fund public infrastructure like schools and parks. That's another thing to consider too. So as we know, we have principal interest taxes and insurance and mortgage insurance. We have our insurance. So if you're buying a rural, it's going to affect your overall monthly payment and also associated closing costs um, and also taxes go into your payment too. Um, so keep that in mind. In our area, a known area that has high Melarus is Lincoln um, and parts of Rockland, California. Um, if you are working in a different market or a different state, talk to your real estate agent and see if there's any areas in your vicinity that has Melarus tax involved. Working off of the PITI and sometimes in a lot of the time mortgage insurance when you're putting less than 20% down is another factor that is important is going to be in the loan product. So the depending on the loan product that we use, we are going to have mortgage insurance no matter what if we put less than 20% down, right? But let's just take the example of a conventional loan. That might be a better option for someone who has a very high FICO score um, and low debt. Um, and the reason why is the higher the FICO score is, the credit score with a conventional loan, your mortgage insurance will be lower than FHA. So if you're at an 800 credit score, it may only be an add-on of like maybe 0.12% of your loan amount divided by 12. Whereas FHA, it's a set standard of 0.55% of your loan amount. It usually makes sense when you're above 700, 720, that conventional is usually going to yield you a lower mortgage insurance. So keep that in mind. But with FHA, usually the threshold is 700 and below, your mortgage insurance is going to be lower as long and also your interest rates. So all your payments put together, your interest rate, which dictates your base mortgage payment and then your mortgage insurance, which is added to, as long as those combine the two and it yields ultimately the lowest, that's going to be what is going to be your best option. That's where it's important to be able to work with a loan officer that understands the di those differences because everyone wants to go conventional, but a lot of the time, especially considering conventional rates have been so high and FHA rates are a lot lower, I've done so many FHA loans this year because the overall monthly payment 
is cheaper um, because most people don't have 800 credit scores. Most people are like 700, 680, 720. Keep that in mind. I want to end. I want to end off with this, guys, and I, I really want to be able to provide you guys with value um, going into the new year. And I really, really want to hear what you guys have to say. I want to hear what kind of content you want to see me cover more. Do you want me to talk a little bit more about? the market? Do you want me to talk less about the market? Do you want me to talk more about maybe specific things more about how to actually qualify for a mortgage or maybe talk about personal finance? The point is I love to hear feedback and I'm just so much looking forward to 2024. I don't know if you noticed we're in a new studio, which is fantastic. So 2024 is going to be a great year. Let's keep those good habits in. Let's take the good habits out and let's make 2024 the best year and let's build some wealth too. See you in the next one.